Hello, dog lovers. I wanted to welcome everyone to the canine dental care webinar brought to you by WAG Out Loud. And my name is Krista. I'm the host of the WAG Out Loud podcast, which is a weekly show where we are obsessed with canine health care, nutrition, and overall well-being. And I'd like to thank our friends at Bow Wow Labs. They are sponsoring this webinar and their product, the Bully Buddy, fits in perfect with today's topic of dental health because bully sticks provide extra dental care in between cleanings. And I just wanted to quickly show you the Bully Buddy, which I love. So you just secure your bully stick in here and tighten it down so that there is no last little inch piece that could be a choking hazard. And it's just an awesome invention. My dog Winston has one and even better, it comes in five different sizes. So it fits dogs of any size or age. Check them out at bowwowlabs.com and they're offering a 10% discount to all of you. You just have to use the code WOL10, wag out loud 10 at checkout to receive 10% off of your purchase. And for those who stick around until the end of the webinar, Bow Wow Labs is doing a giveaway. So don't miss that. All right, just some quick housekeeping for you guys. If you're new to this platform, which is called Crowdcast, it is really user-friendly. I love it. I just wanted to point out some of the features. Why don't we start with the polls? So at the bottom of your screen there, you see polls. And if you go in there now and answer the question there, that is going to give us an idea of how many of you regularly brush your dog's teeth. So if you can go into the poll right now and we can see live, we have so far two people, yes, five, oh, three, yes, <laughs> five, no. So go ahead and do that if you would. And then you'll notice the chat box in the lower right. I see most of you have uh, gone ahead and said hello and where you're where you're coming in from today. So if you haven't done that, wow, we've got somebody from Portugal, JB, hello. And Ohio, California, Arizona. Wow, this is great. So then, so the chat box is just to say something um, nice, like right now, St. Louis, all right, Jared and Kate. Um, when you want to ask a question, you'll see that on the bottom to the left of polls. So use that when you want to ask a question. That's really important um, because you can see questions that other people have asked and you can upvote if you really like their questions. So we'll be taking questions throughout, uh, especially if when Dr. Heidi starts her presentation, if something wasn't clear to you, please ask a question. Um, and then I just want to go ahead. What are we waiting for? I am so honored to have Dr. Heidi Lowprize with us today. And she is here to talk about how we can best care for our dog's dental health, which is so important. Dr. Heidi, thanks for leading this super important discussion today. Can you please introduce yourself and share with everyone why you are so passionate about canine dental health, especially with senior dogs? Sure. And thank you so much for having me. Yes, uh, dentistry has been quite the passion of mine. I've been in practice for 37 years now and strong into dentistry for a good 30 of those years. Year after year, I see how much good dental care can impact the well-being of our pets. And it's sometimes like a little miracle how much better they feel when we finally take care of some of these problems. But I, I'm in Texas. I went to Texas A&M University and I've been in the Dallas Fort Worth area since that time. But moving close to San Antonio next year in the Hill Country. And outside of around 10 years where I was on a teaching team with Pfizer and then with another team with Verbeck, I been, came back into private practice a few years back and I still love what I do. There are a lot of tensions in veterinary medicine and you may have even heard of everything from the suicide rate of veterinarians. But I really like the dental aspect because 
I can get things done and I can work with pet parents and we can make it a team event so we can help our pets out. So are you guys ready to get started? Let's do this. Sounds good. Okay. Yes. Let's see yes. how the PowerPoint comes up. So here it's going to be part of the screen, but I think it's going to be enough that we can still look at it. And then I can see where there's some uh, questions coming up. So does that look good, Krista? Yes, it does. It looks Okay. Beautiful. So as we think about canine dental care, and this is pet dental care, and I'll talk about seniors a bit as well, because I do have a special place in my heart for those older ones, uh, both on a personal level with my old dog buddy, and let's just say I'm empathetic to aging issues these days. When we think about canine dental disease, the most important one we find is periodontal disease. And you may have heard this. Periodontal disease is actually in the infection and inflammation, not of the teeth, but of everything that surrounds the teeth that helps support it in the jaws, in the mouth. You may have heard the term gingivitis. That shows that we've got infection and inflammation in the gum tissues. We can get infection and inflammation in the bone, in the bone socket that that root sits in. There's even a ligament in between the bone and the tooth that helps keep that tooth inside the socket, and we'll lose that periodontal ligament as well. The thing of it is, periodontal disease is a progressive disease, and if we don't do anything to treat it, it will slowly erode away at those tissues. It will cause gum loss. It can cause bone loss. Certainly the periodontal ligament is lost at that point in time. And when we lose enough of these support tissues, then the tooth is lost. And we want to try to keep that from happening whenever possible. Now we know that it's very common in all dogs, but especially those over two years of age, there's at least some level of gingivitis inflammation if not more severe periodontal disease in 75 to 80% of dogs over two years of age. As pets get older, this incidence of periodontal disease increases. That's because the teeth have been around longer. As we have smaller dogs, the increased incidence of periodontal disease can be quite impactful. With less bone around those roots, a two millimeter amount of bone loss in a dachshund, like this little one sitting on our bottom, is a lot more important than a two millimeter bone loss in a Great Dane. So size does matter in this type of issue. And smaller dogs live longer. So many of my patients are small, older dogs that sometimes have extensive periodontal disease. It's not just periodontal disease that we look for in dogs too. Quite often we'll look for broken teeth and sometimes we'll even see tumors, some type of cancer that can be present in their mouths. So there's a lot that can happen in the oral cavity of dogs and cats. So when we look at periodontal disease, we have to understand what causes it. So no matter how clean a tooth is, a soft sticky substance called plaque sticks to the tooth surface it's that stuff you feel in the morning before you brush your teeth. And the plaque has bacteria in it. Bacteria causes infection, causes inflammation from the body. We can brush plaque off when it's still soft. But if the plaque is not brushed off, then minerals from the saliva help turn the plaque into tartar or calculus on the tooth surface. That's why we usually have a lot of calculus on the upper fourth premolar as shown in this picture, because that's right where the salivary ducts spill out the saliva with the minerals. Once it's formed into this hard tartar, it can't be brushed off. Sometimes chewing certain objects may help wear some of it off, but typically to get it completely clean again, we're going to have to have a professional cleaning, just like when you go to your dentist. When we see periodontal disease progress, that's when we start seeing more accumulation of tartar, more plaque now sticks on this roughened tartar. We get more tartar formed until you can almost see the different layers. And then sometimes we get hair and grass and all kinds of debris caught up in there. While the bacteria in the plaque can cause infection in the gums and in the bones surrounding the teeth, 
it is also the body trying to fight the bacteria that can destroy its own tissues. In some particular cases, some dogs with ulcerative disease or cats with stomatitis, this body response can be overreactive and can cause significant problems. But whether it's a bacteria or the body's immune system, once we start losing this tissue, once we start having gum recession and bone loss, it's almost impossible to get back. So what are the typical signs of periodontal disease? Certainly bad breath. Um, now, you know, there is a form of doggy breath that may not be too severe. And sometimes some people are very aware of it, but sometimes it occurs so gradually, you're not even sure it's that bad because you've gotten used to it. Maybe they've started eating hard food or treats and they only want the soft food now, or maybe they're not eating well or even weight loss. Tell you what, I've seen a lot of dogs with pretty significant dental disease, periodontal disease, even tumors that are still eating great. So it sometimes takes a lot to make a dog stop eating. Cats are a different story. But a lot of times the real signs of periodontal disease that you might notice at home, there may be nothing except for possibly that oral odor Periodontal disease tends not to be acutely painful, but it can get painful later in the disease when they have loose teeth or when we have hidden problems with deeper infections. So it may look typical, but we may find surprises as well. You certainly can check your dog's mouth out and look at it and do good home care. And typically, this is something that is best to start training from puppyhood onward. Getting them used to having the head handled, making sure they're not head shy, getting them used to having the lips lifted up gently. Now, in a fear-free manner, it's usually best if you approach them from behind or when they're at your side, because that's a little less aggressive than approaching them from the front. You can either support the head and even lift the lower chin up, or even grasp it with your opposite hand and then gently lift up the lips. As you lift up the lips, get them used to handling those lips handled, rubbing against the cheeks, and even rubbing against the gums and the teeth. That way you can get them on a brushing program. Now, if they seem painful, if it seems like there's a lot of blood, if there seems to be any discomfort or the pet is just not gonna have it without potentially biting you, then don't try it at home. Let the professionals handle it. When we do get it periodontal disease, that gum loss, that bone loss, we can get loose teeth, we might need extractions. I cannot tell you the number of times that we've had such bad periodontal disease, especially on the lower jaw, the mandible, especially at that lower first premolar, the big tooth there, the bone loss causes that jaw to be very weak and either during an altercation with another dog or sometimes just jumping off the bed and hitting wrong, that jaw can break. This is what we call a pathologic fracture. Unfortunately, unlike a broken bone in a leg that breaks just from trauma, but is still strong, it's difficult to get this bone to heal well because it's already diseased. So, Whenever we can, we don't want to get to this level of disease. It's also not just about the teeth or the jaws. The fact is the infection of periodontal disease, the inflammation that it causes can impact every other organ in the body. More and more they've got studies in human medicine and dentistry and now veterinary medicine and dentistry that poor periodontal health can distinctly impact disease of the heart and the valves of the heart, liver, kidneys, lungs, you name it. Even just the broad aspect of having a chronic inflammation can impact the body overall. So when we're treating the teeth, we're treating the rest of the dog as well. And with few cases, 
periodontal disease is preventable. Now, you may have some specific dogs that have a lot of inflammation and even brushed in, keeping their teeth completely clean and regular dental cleans. They may still have some, some tooth loss and might have some problems. But with good early dental care, the American Animal Hospital Association is recommending, especially in young, small dogs, the first dental cleaning with radiographs and x-rays by one to two years of age. Put that together with good home care. And like I say, this is a team sport. We can really keep these teeth pretty healthy. We do need to recognize there are some breeds that are at higher risk for periodontal disease. Any dog that's going to be under 20 to 25 pounds as an adult is definitely at risk. Like I said, we don't have a lot of reserve bone there. If we start losing bone due to periodontal disease, we're going to lose a lot of teeth. Brachycephalic dogs, boxers, bulldogs, French bulldogs, their teeth are often very crowded, especially in the upper jaw. And quite often they're so crowded that once we get any kind of infection or bone loss there, again, the teeth are at risk. And definitely from human medicine, we know that diabetic patients have real problems with periodontal disease. Not only does diabetes make periodontal disease worse, but having periodontal disease that's not treated means that it's difficult to keep diabetic patients regulated. So they play off each other, they're comorbidities. As we look at early periodontal disease, this dog had quite a bit of calculus, but we we're able to clean it off. We've got some slightly pink gingival margins that have some mild inflammation, but they're gonna calm down now that they're cleaned up. We go from very early cases that we wanna keep them from having any changes to even moderate areas of bone loss. If we do have moderate areas of bone loss, but can clean the teeth and do home care, maybe we can stop the bone and gum loss from getting any worse. The other thing we'll do is as we look at the teeth, unfortunately not all teeth are created equal. I'll be honest with you. I'll do a little bit more treatment on the large canine teeth and this upper fourth premolar and lower first molar, the large teeth in back or our carnasal teeth or chewing teeth. If I have a diseased fourth premolar next to that lower first molar, or if I have a diseased incisor next to my lower canine tooth, I will extract those teeth and in fact get better access to that important tooth and do more work to keep the remaining teeth healthy. So we can treat earlier stages, we can treat moderate stages. We can even treat advanced stages of periodontal disease. Here's an x-ray of this lower first molar that has a pretty deep pocket on the back root to the left with a darker area where we have a little bit of bone loss there. Now, if we let this bone loss continue, it can end up being like that jaw that was fractured because we lose bone. Well, we're able to put in bone graft material and do regenerative medicine now for dentistry to help strengthen that jaw and save these teeth. So we can do some pretty extensive work. Sometimes we're not able to do the extensive work and sometimes we just have to do extensive extractions. We have patients that we do full mouth extractions either due to long, long standing untreated periodontal disease or sometimes if their gum tissue is so inflamed that the body is overreacting to the periodontal bacteria that by extracting the teeth will make them healthier and happier. And you know what? We call them gummy bears, but they do quite nicely, even without a single tooth in their head. So we talked about treating the teeth, treating the jaws. It also benefits the patient. If anybody out there has Cavalier or King Charles, you know the two major issues they have are dental disease and heart disease. And those two go hand in hand. With our cleaning, not only do we take out all the garbage, all the bacteria, sometimes those pieces of grass. I've seen cat litter in the calculus in some of these dogs. We extract the infected teeth, the ones that have infection active there. 
And that way we can help decrease the, the infection and inflammation that impacts the rest of the body. Over and over, we have these patients that it's not just about, oh, my mouth feels better now, but I feel better now overall. So as you're looking at your patient, at your pet, at your baby, what does a good dental procedure look like? And the one thing I will say without question, adequate treatment needs general anesthesia. Anesthesia-free dental cleanings are cosmetic. They can remove calculus off the crown of the tooth, but they can't get into the deeper areas, no matter how good the person performing it is. And no matter how good the dog seems to be as they're bundled up, having their, having their mouth and their teeth scraped, I think this causes undue stress on the patient, to be honest with you. Also, as we do the anesthesia for our pets, we use an endotracheal tube that goes down the patient's airway. And this protects their lungs with this cuffed endotracheal tube, a gentle balloon is on that endotracheal tube to keep fluids, bacteria, even debris from getting down in there. With them under anesthesia and stable, we can do the complete exam, probing for any pockets, looking for any loose teeth, and taking dental x-rays. I could not practice good dentistry without my x-rays. Once I'm able to see what's going on, see a complete assessment of these teeth. Now I'm able to do the complete treatment, which includes cleaning subgingivally or underneath the gum line, the most the important place to treat the disease. So I know talking about anesthesia brings up concerns and certainly there are gonna be some general anesthesia risks. With good preoperative care that we'll talk about in a minute, we can minimize these risks. In fact, as a board certified dentist, I bet we see even a higher percentage of risky patients than most because we do have some patients that number one, the risks are there and they wanna minimize those risks. We are comfortable with these patients and we can probably do it a little bit faster because we've got the skills and the equipment to do so. We also see a good number of senior patients. And when we see these senior patients, we do the preoperative work. We try to use less drugs and we'll customize specific drugs for each patient depending on their needs. Particularly with these guys, we really watch body temperature regulation. And if there are concurrent diseases, we make sure we manage those along with the dental disease to make sure we get the best help possible. Now, a common question we have is when we talk about extractions is how will he, how will she eat without the teeth? Oh my goodness. Well, meet Bubba Gump. Not only has Bubba Gump lost both sides of his mandible in the front due to the pathological fractures, but we had to extract every other tooth in his mouth. And we, we gave him a little chin tuck so the chin wouldn't be hanging down there. But of course, his tongue hangs out a little bit. And Bubba Gump has to be careful about getting overweight now. He's feeling so good. Of course, with all this care and with all this treatment, specialized for these patients, there will always be an issue with cost. And that is something as you look at it long term. I tell people who are going to be getting a small puppy or they bring them in for uh, puppy exams, if they're gonna be small dogs, get insurance early. If you need to, there are ways of trying to help pay for the cost, care credit or whatnot. We even talked to one young lady the other day who's gonna open up a GoFundMe page with pictures of the dog. So yes, there will be some costs involved, but the benefits of getting good dental care, just amazing. So we talked about our preoperative assessment. We're gonna do a very good physical exam, both the day of the consultation and the day of the procedure. We're gonna look at blood work, urinalysis. If we have any cardiac or lung issues or abdomen issues, we're gonna want x-rays. If we have advanced cardiac issues, heart issues, we'll probably wanna get an echo done and even seen by a cardiologist prior to. 
maybe even treated before they come for the dental procedure so they're stable. We like to see blood pressure. And often when we're doing this blood work, hidden problems arise, mild kidney disease, mild liver disease that may not have been apparent, but now that we're doing these assessments and blood work, we're getting to make sure that the pet's health is good all around. The day of the procedure, pretty intense at times. We take very good care of our patients as I'm sure most veterinarians do. We put an IV catheter in fluids. They do get a little pre-anesthetic injection just to help calm them down. Little something that's similar to Valium, little something similar to, uh, to morphine, and they're feeling pretty good by the time we put in that IV catheter to start the fluids to keep them from getting dehydrated. We'll use that cuffed endotracheal tube to support the airway. Lots of monitoring, blood pressure, heart rate, respiration rate, and end tidal CO2, EKG. They have as much hooked up to them as you might during a major surgery. An important thing, especially with our older, smaller dogs, is we make sure they maintain body warmth. And we have something called a hot dog that I love that really helps keep them nice and toasty. Pain management is done before, during, and afterwards. Even though they're under anesthesia, we still use the local blocks to numb the area that we're going to be treating. So when they wake up, they'll still be pretty comfortable. And then we send them home on pain medication. So there's a lot involved. Now, when we're doing our procedures, we call the owners at the beginning when they get their injection. Then we give them a second call because quite often we have to go over any revisions to our treatment plan. With dental x-rays, we quite often find things we had not anticipated. In fact, having a boring dental cleaning is not common at all. So when we find all these problems, we revise the treatment plan. One of the technicians or our dental director calls the owner, the pet parent, and goes over the revisions to get the okay for the additional problems that we have found. And then we finish up on the pup. At discharge, in the past, we would get the pet parent in the room and go over the photos and x-rays. Now we have our technicians go out with our white glove curbside discharge. We go over all the instructions for pain medication, antibiotics if needed. If there's any surgery, we'll use soften the food. I prefer softening their regular food with warm or hot water till it's a little bit softer versus changing to a canned food. I don't like to change too much. And then sometimes we do have to send them home with a cone of shame to help protect all that surgery that we've done. This is little Anastasia who two weeks later, after having her face ripped open by a bigger dog, was actually doing pretty darn well. So she had instructions to come back in two weeks and we liked seeing her come back as a lively puppy. The first night we let owners know your patient may be a little sleepy, look a little drunk. Sometimes they're a little bit more vocal, depends on how much of a diva they are, if they're gonna win that Oscar award or not. Uh, first few days, they may be a little bit slower may not eat as well as they're getting used to whatever teeth may have been extracted or even sutures or even major surgery for growth removals. We have some that eat amazingly well because whatever disease they had is now gone and they're feeling better even with having had oral surgery. Now they may not drink as much water, but remember they got fluids in their IV line, intravenous line with fluids, and they're getting extra water in the food so they're probably still hydrated. So we usually ask, are they still urinating? If they are, then they're getting plenty of water. One of my favorite days is the two week follow up. We like to look at the mouth, make sure everything's healing well, see how the sutures are doing. They're usually dissolving quite nicely by then. If everything's healing up nicely, they can go back to the regular diet and we'll discuss home care. Over and over again, we hear the same thing. Oh my goodness, she is feeling so much better. She's like a puppy again. This little dog, Bob, believe it or not, only had a couple incisors extracted. It was pretty minor. But almost immediately, he wanted to 
start taking his owner for a walk, grabbing that leash like he used to do in the past, but he hadn't been doing it for the last couple of months. So that owner knew right away Bob had been hurting and now he was feeling better. Now in mild cases, usually you can get a dental procedure done every 12 months. We don't see too many mild cases. So I would say the majority of our patients we like to see back in nine months if we've done periodontal work or had a lot of periodontal disease with extractions or even six months if it was really severe disease or we did some specialized procedures. But we sure like seeing those dogs act like puppies again. So what can we do as a team, as a group, as parents? Certainly regular exams at home and at the office that office, regular professional care, and home care. There are as many home care products out there as Carter has little pills. Uh, you youngsters have to ask an old person about that one. Now we do have the Veteran Oral, Oral Health Care Council, vohc.org, that does have a listing of products that have done testing and have met preset standards. Just because product's not on that list does not mean it's not effective, but you'll have to rely on your own experience or experience of your veterinarian, their, their recommendations to see what really is effective. And by far, good effective brushing will always be the gold standard. It takes the most work, but the easier, easier thing is, the less likely it's gonna be extremely effective. So brushing is still the best using soft bristle toothbrush, using the finger toothbrush, even the little cat toothbrush on the lower left side. Literally being able to get the brush tips in a 45 degree angle to the sulcus with a circular motion is ideal. I will take whatever your pet will allow you to do. And sometimes your pet won't allow you to do much. But see if you can get a good schedule going. Start out slow, gradually build up. At our practice, we'll even do a toothpaste taste test and see what flavor they like best. And in some patients, some patient owner combinations, brushing's not going to be very effective or could be painful at times. In some smaller dogs and even cats, I actually like using some of the dental wipes because it's a little less abrasive. It's not going to be as effective as brushing, but it can help. And I try to approach them from behind. Again, that fear-free kind of compassionate approach. I'll use it with my fingers. Let me see if this video will go for you. And I'll start by rubbing against the cheeks, scratching the chin, scratching the ears, and gradually pulling back on those lips until I can rub the wipe against the two surfaces itself. Now you're gonna start out with just a little bit each time and gradually build up. And you'll be surprised because remember that upper fourth premolar gets most of the calculus. You can get that area first, you're gonna have a pretty ha happy camper on your hands. Chews can be very helpful, but there are some limits. So number one, you need to have some compressibility with that chew if it has any kind of diameter. It has to be either flat or bendable, or you need to be able to put your thumbnail into it. Now, you're gonna have that dilemma that you've got a dog that unless he has something big and hard, he's gonna eat in two seconds. That's kind of tough. Make sure you're always there when you're checking out a, a new type of chew. You don't want them to swallow huge bits. But unfortunately, something like the antler in the middle there, when they can really isolate that with our canasal teeth, the chewing teeth, they can break teeth. That's why we have a little picture where it says, thank you for supporting our dental practice. Because when we see broken teeth, we either get to do extractions or root canals. Now this cute little red ball to keep uh, both environmental enrichment and keep the dog from eating too quickly. Unfortunately, the dog got its teeth stuck within the ball. So be careful there as well. Always make sure you monitor them, especially with a new toy, and then see what works best for your pet. So here's a result, both of periodontal disease on the premolar to the right side and a broken crown on the upper fourth premolar, the most common tooth to be broken when we give hard chew toys. This is pretty obviously 
pretty obvious. I've got a broken tooth with a dark center that's the pulp with the dead nerve, the dead pulp inside. We can also have trauma that doesn't break the teeth, but might have a gray or purplish tooth. And those may be intact, but still with a dead pulp. The thing of it is, no matter how that pulp got compromised, extraction or root canal are the only options. They may not have the abscess underneath the eye. They may not have any swelling. They may not show anything. But that chronic infection and inflammation is actually getting into the body through the root tip with bone loss at the root tip and impacting the rest of the body. So we need to take care of these as well. Another benefit to home care is being in your pet's mouth on a regular basis. So if a mass starts to grow and it's much smaller than this one here, we can get to it earlier. We can remove it while it's smaller. And that is our best chance for having an impact with oral tumors. This particular one is actually benign, but very aggressive locally. So we still had to take out a good portion of her lower jaw there just to make sure it wouldn't recur. If all, all tumors get so large because you can't, you aren't looking in the mouth that they finally start bleeding or causing the dog to choke or whatnot, they may be very large by that time. So make sure you look in the mouth on a regular basis and you have your veterinarian check the mouth on a regular basis. Because between you and your vet, you can make a difference. From puppyhood to when they're seniors, and I don't care how big they get, some dogs remain puppies, just like this lap-sitting Doberman. We can provide good exams, good home care. We can prevent periodontal disease and broken teeth, have a healthier mouth, and have a healthier pet. Not only do I believe that good dental care gives us a better quality of life for our pets, they feel better, I strongly believe it can even lengthen their lifespan as well. So with that, uh, Krista, do we want to go to any questions? Yes. So as we mentioned in the beginning, everybody just goes to the bottom of your screen, ask a question, type it in there, and we will go through those one at a time. And Dr. Heidi, that was awesome. Thank you. So now everybody's going to go look for broken and gray teeth. Yes, that's kind of important. <laughs> oh, it really is. And the thing of it is, a lot of veterinarians may not have had great dental training in university, or they may not be as comfortable with it. So when I teach them, too, and I tell them, you know, those gray or purple teeth, you need to extract your root canal, I said, you're going to probably hate me next Monday when you go back to your clinic and it's a 90 pound pit bull with a purple lower canine tooth because those are really tough to get out. Um, but again, even though they don't show any pain with it, once we've done the root canal or extraction, that two week recheck, they feel better. Oh. So well, we have our first question in. Okay. Uh, Pam is asking, what do you think about additives in drinking water? So I kind of mentioned briefly that if something's really easy to do, the level of effectiveness probably is a little bit lower. Those are probably going to be a little bit better for oral odor. It might help out a little bit with the bacteria, but for full getting the plaque and everything, it's not going to be as effective as a mechanical effect like brushing. It can help help reduce it. So if you can help reduce it a little bit and continue with good care, then at least you're headed in the right direction. Okay. And I know I wanted to ask you about mm -hmm. toothpaste. Yes. Do you recommend an enzymatic toothpaste like Veerback, which is what I use, the poultry flavor to be exact, is what Winston prefers. Never I had to taste test? I, you know what? He's had the beef before, but he seems to like the poultry better. Most of them don't like the beef. I don't know why. Poultry or a vanilla mint, oh, if they yeah. like any of those flavors. Yeah, those are the two favorites so far. Um, so definitely use a veterinary toothpaste, never use human toothpaste, right? Human toothpaste have detergents and fluorides foaming effect. We spit it out. I don't, 
know too many dogs that expectorate, except for maybe boxers. So they're going to swallow it. So it has to be safe to swallow. And having that enzymatic component of it actually helps turn some of the enzymes in the mouth to antibacterial. Now, again, the effect of the toothpaste without a lot of brushing will help out a little bit, but it's that mechanical brushing of the soft plaque to, to get it off the tooth before it turns into tartar or calculus. Okay. And what do you think about brushing with coconut oil because it is an antimicrobial? It is antimicrobial to an extent, but probably not to the same level as lactoperoxidase toothpaste, the enzymatic toothpaste. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, well, as people are still thinking of more questions, I just wanted to share something that I experienced. Um, Winston loves his bully sticks. And by the way, to soften them up, I just take the bully stick and put it in hot water first. Yes. Make so, sure it has a little compressibility to it. Absolutely. Good. Um, and I noticed that he split his teeth in half. Ah. From the bully stick. And I thought, oh, this isn't good. So we got the extractions he was taken care of. But I later learned after getting a nutritional test from uh, Parsley Pet, their nutritional blueprint, that he was very low in calcium. Yeah. Okay. And that made me think that his body was taking calcium from the teeth. And that could be why his teeth so easily split because it's once possible. Got, what, what kind of dog is he? He's a Norwich terrier, 15 pounds. Okay. You, you just said terrier. Mm -hmm. I did terriers and corgis outside of big dogs. Their, their determination. How's that for a good word? Yeah. To really, you know, get at those. Uh, usually it's a force of it. Once the enamels formed when they're young, it's usually, stable at that point, but it's a possibility. Mm. Yeah. But good bone strength is important too. Yes, absolutely. Okay. We have another question that came in. Pam has another one. She's asking is once a week brushing often enough to make a difference? Well, a study was done and they actually had a study doing twice a week in some wolves. And I'm not sure who was doing the wolves, but, uh, it helps out a bit because it takes seven to 10 days for plaque to turn into calculus. So it may decrease how much tartar you have on the teeth, but it's the bacterial in the plaque against the gums that can cause the inflammation and infection. So a little bit more often would be better. If I want people to do two to three times a week, I'll tell them daily. And my pet parents who do it daily, I can tell a difference. I can tell a big difference. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That was good. All right. And I see Irene is mentioning something in the comments. Yep. Um, she says, I brush our two dogs' teeth and use an enzymatic water additive. They mm -hmm. get whimsies more frequently than bully sticks. Is one more effective than the other? So the whimsies versus the bully sticks. So let's just say I haven't seen a study on either one, and I definitely have not seen a study comparing the two. <laughs> so I'm afraid I can't answer. You know, to me, a lot of it is based on personal, and not personal owner, but personal for the dog, pedalized, personalized for the dog what seems to be most effective for them right. as long as it doesn't cause any damage then if that seems to be the the best for that particular patient we'll go from there and what do you think about those really hard bones like uh and knuckle bones and it helps it helps my practice I'm it built my that. practice i get to do root canals and extract teeth oh yeah not good. and Will there be a dog who eats some of that hard stuff for years and never have a problem? Absolutely. That can happen. But like I say, if you have something of a diameter, they can then really get between the, the two carnasal teeth and crunch down. The PSI of dog jaws is just amazing compared to humans. Uh, and then you have pit bulls. That's even more than regular dogs. So if the bone 
or the antler is not going to split, something's going to split. Right. And it might even just cause little micro cracks initially, and then they might break their tooth on something that's not as hard. But that that hard chewing can can cause some distinct problems. Yep. Not always, but like I say, it'll keep me busy. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have a question from JB from Portugal. Okay. And the question is, what is your opinion on dental treats? Any brand that you usually advise? And again, it, it's somewhat what seems to be best for the pet. What you want to make what you want to make sure is, is it something that when they chew on it, it is going to make a difference, not just a diet. OK, so like the HD diet with the way that it squeegees the teeth, the Orvet chews, it has additional Delmopinol that decreases the plaque building up, different things like that. Um, and chewing time. I want to see at least 15 to 30 seconds chewing time on these devices because if they go chomp, chomp, gulp and swallow it whole, it's not going to do much. The other thing we don't think about often is how many calories are they getting with the different shoes? If they're supposed to get, I think, I can't remember why, there was one cat shoe that they were supposed to get 30 a day wow. to have the effectiveness to get the decrease because they had the VOH seal for the decrease in the plaque and tartar, but they had to chew on 30 a day. And you can get some pretty fat pets that way. Right. So again, kind of base it on uh, your particular pet. I have the most familiarity for years and years with the flat rawhides with CE chews, but make sure they don't swallow big chunks. That's very important. Um, it also has the enzymatic toothpaste on those. Um, the greenies have some good data behind them. The Oravet chews have some good data behind them. The Veggie Dent, Veggie Dent Fresh now have some good data behind them. So it, it, it's quite a variety. Another thing people don't think about chews sometimes is even the non-consumable ones that might be not hard, hard plastic, but a little bit of give to them. It also gives them some playtime, what we call environmental enrichment. The dogs really do well with versus just sitting around all day. Now, Greyhound, my Greyhound, he sleeps 99.9% .9 of the time. He doesn't need a lot of environmental enrichment other than his big soft bed. But toys, uh, the feeding toys, things like that may be very helpful for those that need a little bit more work in their day. Okay, thank you. Our next question, uh, we have a question asking, can you use baking soda occasionally? So baking soda occasionally, possibly. I know there were baking soda toothpaste for people for a while. What do we do with those toothpastes? We spit them out. It's got a pretty high sodium load. So too much sodium is not good for blood pressure, for heart issues, things like that. So it's typically not something I'll go with too often. Unless you can teach them to spit. Oh, that, that would be a good trick. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Irene has a question. She's saying, I've seen some people scrape tartar from their dog's teeth using a tool from a dental kit. These are pretty calm, well-trained dogs. Is this a good idea if you think your dog will tolerate this procedure, like trying one tooth at a time slowly over time? So using some of these dental instruments, if they're going to be effective for removing calculus tartar, um, they actually are sharpened. Does that tell you anything? So you have a sharp edge to them. And when they're doing it in your mouth, you know, they're getting up underneath the gum line and everything else. And I've had some hygienists that have caused me to be less than comfortable doing hand scaling with the instruments they use. So generally speaking, I'm very cautious about recommending that. Even with people who, ha who are hygienists and have really calm dogs, you can cause etching on the tooth surface that makes it even quicker to build up plaque and calculus. So you, you can chunk off big chunks, but it's really not a complete cleaning. Right. So someone, he was having me write down some of those dental brands I'm gonna do. I don't know if they have them in Portugal, though. We'll see. <laughs> well, that's why online is so beautiful. There you go. 
And while you're doing that, Dr. Heidi, um, what was I going to ask? Oh, darn it. I just totally spaced. I resemble that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Old age, not fun. The ideal time of brushing your teeth, or brushing their teeth, mm -hmm. is it two minutes like humans that we work um, up that? Pomeranian versus Great Dane. It's going to take quite a bit of difference. Right. I'd say the ideal time is the time that the dog lets you allows you to do it. And that may be a short fuse on some patients. It may be he might he might enjoy the the flavor of the toothpaste and let you sit there for 5 minutes if you want. So I'd say at least about a minute or so and even if they won't let you do a complete brushing, do like I did with the wipes on the kitty cat, come from behind the head and even with a finger brush apply some of the toothpaste and rub back and try to get those upper fourth premolars back here. Um, and then gradually, you know, build up from there. And is it enough just to brush the outside? Cause you really, it's hard to get inside. It's very difficult to brush the inside of the teeth. I have seen some dogs that will allow their owners to do so. When we have some owners that are good at brushing the external surfaces where we see the most amount of calculus, then is going to be inside the lower premolars because that's where you're, uh, salivary ducts underneath the tongue come out. Got it. Yep. Oh, I remembered what I forgot. The not recommended anesthesia free teeth cleaning. Is that bad yes. in that they're scraping bacteria and that's just going into their system? Well, a couple things that make me anxious about it. First off, no matter how good the dog is, and I've been through some fear, what's called fear free training for pets to try to decrease their stress and everything else. No matter how they're good they are, they're wrapped up and now you're working in their mouth and that just bothers me a little bit. With everything that is loosened up, there is a possibility they could inhale bacteria and even chunks of calculus. A uh, couple, couple reported cases of lung abscess due to calculus and not, not from procedures, but then even teeth that had loosened up the dog then inhaled, not from the anesthesia-free anesthesia -free dental cleaning, but, but the biggest thing other than you can't take x-rays, you can't treat. I've had a number of clients who have come to us saying, oh, but he, she's had her teeth cleaned every three to six months, da, da, da. We get in there, we start taking x-rays, the surfaces look beautiful, and we get in and there's horrific deep disease. The clients aren't even upset with the veterinarian or the caregiver who did this. They then blame themselves for, oh my gosh, I thought I was doing the best I could for my pet, for my baby. And here I was just covering it up. And that's, that's kind of heart rending a little bit. So like, like we in dentistry like to say, you must get to the root of the problem. There you go. Yeah. Well, we are about to wrap up and I don't see any other questions now, but if anybody has one, please type it in there. Dr. Heidi, that was amazing. Um, I would love to know if everybody found value from being here today. And if there is one thing that you learned from Dr. Heidi's presentation, could you add that to the comment box? Would just Love to get your feedback on Absolutely. your time spent. That would be great. And as we promised, the special giveaway. Uh, again, our friends at Bow Wow Labs are giving away a full starter kit to one lucky winner. So, again, that's the bully buddy that I mentioned before that secures your bully stick. Uh, they have five different sizes. So, you get to choose for the size of your dog. And then you get five of their premium hand-sorted bully sticks in a sealable stay fresh jar. So a great prize. Uh, and again, soak your bully sticks in hot water before yes. you come to your dog to get them started. Dr. Heidi, can you ask a question regarding what you covered in your presentation? And the first person to answer correctly is going to win this um, starter kit from Bow Wow Labs. 
Name one factor that puts a pet at higher risk for periodontal disease. Oh. Jared and Kate say age. Boy. Is that it? They, they took the shortest typed word. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Small size, Pam. Yeah. Smaller breeds, JB. Cool. Well, Jared and Kate, if you could just email me with your mailing address, and I will put my email in here so you can send it to me. And if anybody has any suggestions or comments or anything else, there's my email. Uh, also for the podcast, if you have any guest recommendations or anything like that, please, I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, just a reminder that if you didn't win, if you are not Jared and Kate <laughs> and are interested <laughs> in ordering a Bully Buddy, you can still get the 10% off by using WOL10 at checkout at bowwowlabs.com. Again, thank you to them for sponsoring this episode. Dr. Heidi, we so appreciate you for hanging out with us today and teaching us some great life enhancing information for our dogs. Could you please let everyone know where they can learn more about you? Oh, um, I guess at our main street <laughs> or great. I don't usually, I usually don't talk about my website <laughs> because it's usually for people who are, you know, kind of local and whatnot. Um, I wouldn't say Google because you don't want to find out that. What about on gray muzzle? Oh, oh, that, let, let me put the gray muzzle.org because that's just a cool, that's just a cool website. Sorry. Dot org. That is a really neat website about older pets. And we love those old gray ones. Yes. If you guys, there's tons of information about how to care for senior dogs. Uh, and Dr. Heidi is a part of that. So that is a great place to reach out. Uh, and one more thing you might have noticed, the green everything about CBD for your dog button at the bottom of your screen. Be sure to click on that to register for this free master class. It's next month. And in this pretty much unregulated industry of CBD for dogs, there is a lot of information I didn't even know about. You know, how do you find a good product? Uh, because most of them are very expensive. So yeah. what do you look for? And we have three experts that are going to be on next month. And space is limited. Again, it's free. A master class is just like this, but it's 90 minutes. And we have our three experts. So reserve your spot and be sure to invite your friends. You can click right there. And we appreciate Dr. Heidi for being here. And again, thanks to all of you for taking the time and I wish everybody a tail wagging day. Bye.